Hello, everyone. My name is Todd Gailey, and I'm here with Bob San Heinrich to talk about packlets and the packlet repository. Hello. I'll start things off with a general discussion of packlets, and then Bob will take over to talk in more detail about the specifics of the packlet repository. All right, let's get started. All right, so packlets. Packlets are heavily used within Wolfram Research. There's actually over 270 packlets in the Mathematica 13 layout. But we now want to document and expose this packet system to users. We are creating a packet repository that will accept user submissions. We really want to create a big ecosystem of packlets that are easily discoverable uh, and accessible and easily installable. And this next sentence is really the take home message from my part of this talk which is that if you're creating any kind of add-on content for Wolf products, it does not fit into one of the other repositories. Like for example, a standalone function for the function repository, then you should create it in the form of a packlet. All right, so what are packlets? Well, they're units of Wolfram functionality packaged up in a way that allows them to be discovered, installed, updated, and integrated seamlessly into the Wolfram environment. All right, that sounds great. The essential element that makes a packlet is the packlet info file, which is a small, simple file of metadata that describes the packlet, its requirements, the ways in which it extends the Wolfram environment. And that is the essential component. A bunch of files becomes a packlet simply by virtue of having a packlet info file uh, tossed in next to them. And then just for terminology's sake, the component of the Wolfram engine that deals with packlets is called the Packlet Manager. It provides functions to find, install, update, remove, and manage packlets. Okay, so some important features of packlets. First, packets are versioned. Packet Manager always uses the highest version number of a packlet that it finds. This allows side-by-side -side installation of multiple versions, possibly with different requirements and compatibilities. Packets have requirements. So packets can declare that they're compatible with only certain versions of Mathematica, right? Or certain system ID values. Packets can say, I only run on you know, Windows 32 or something. Or, or certain product names, like uh, only under Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition or something. Packlets that don't match the current system, whose requirements you know, don't match, they simply become invisible and they will not be used. It doesn't matter if they're installed, if they don't match the current system, they simply will become invisible. And finally, finally, crucially, packlets have extensions. Extensions are the things that describe the ways in which a packlet extends the system. Packlet announces to the packet manager that it contains certain types of content. You know, I have a palette or some style sheets say, or I have uh, you know, Wolfram language code. I have documentation. I have a Wolfram library. I have some JLink jar files, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so this is really the fundamental principle of the packet manager. If, if you understand the fundamental principle, then you'll understand a lot of things about why things are behaving the way they are. Just simply that when a packlet, when the pack, when when the system looks for a packlet by name or looks for some sort of resource that a packlet might provide, the packet manager finds all the packlets that provide that resource, and then calls out any that are disabled or don't match the current system requirements, and then it picks the highest version. It uses the packlet that has the highest version number. So version numbers are sort of of crucial importance in the packet manager. That's a much smarter lookup than a simple like linear search from start to finish through dollar path. It's also important to know that when, when looking for a file, the packet manager gets consulted first. So you know, dollar path is only even relevant after the packet manager has had a chance to find a resource. So packlets have primacy in terms of all sorts of resource lookup. 
All right. So, so if the packet info file is all important, let's let's take a look at packet info files. So, like I said before, it's the it's the presence of a packet info file that makes the collection of files into a packlet. It's a simple file of metadata in Wolfram language format. Of course, you can also name it packlet info .m, and you'll most existing packet info files have that name, but uh, we're really encouraging people to use to the .wl file name. All right, so here's a very, very simple packet info file. It starts with this head, you know, packlet object. And then the contents are inside an association. It's just basically a list of rules or properties, we might call them. Every packlet has to have a name and a version. Those are the only two required properties. Please notice that the version is a string. It's not, it's not a number. Of course, it's interpreted as a number, but it's a string. So this packlet has the name file utilities of version. And then here's the extensions part. And this is really the important part of a packlet. This is where a packlet, like I said, describes the ways in which it extends the system. And this packlet says, I have a kernel extension. That means I have some Wolfram language code. And it says, the context I provide is file utilities. So when a packet like this is installed in the system, someone does needs file utilities, the packet manager says, aha, I know where that context is, it's in this packet. And it knows how to find the file utilities.m file from within the packet. All right, so in this extremely simple packet info file, what would the layout on disk of that packet look like? like? Very simple, you have some directory called file utilities. Now the actual name of the directory that contains the packet info file is not, is not important. I could rename this directory anything I wanted and the packet would still function exactly the same way. The name of the packet is determined by the packet info file. But of course, you typically name your directories after the packet name. And if you create a .packet file and install it, you know, the usual workflow for packlets. Uh, the, wrapping directory gets automatically created by the packet manager with an appropriate name. But in any case, so here we have a directory of value utilities that just has that packet info file in it, and it just has a kernel subdirectory and that one file file utilities.wl. The reason it has this directory called kernel, well, we, we encourage packet authors to include subdirectories for every type of content. It's, much, it's a much cleaner uh, layout if you have subdirectories for the different types of resources that your packet has. So the convention for uh, kernel files is, is a kernel subdirectory. You see that here, root arrow kernel in the packet info file. That is, that is how, where you tell the packet manager that the, the root of an extension is the subdirectory of the packet in which those resources are found. So we say root arrow kernel. If this had said root arrow foo, well then this directory would have needed to be called foo. All right, so very simple. If I have a file utilities.wl file and I wanna make a packet out of it, I just put it in a kernel subdirectory. I create a packet info file like this, throw it alongside, and now I've got a packet. I will mention here that this is the uh, older format for packet info files. Uh, most packet info files are actually in this format now. If you look at them, they have the, the head of the expression is packlet instead of packet object. There's no association, and the left-hand side of rules are symbols, not strings. We're not really recommending people use this format. We're not really documenting it, but you can still use it. It works perfectly fine. It will continue to work perfectly fine. Uh, we just transition to a new format. But if you look around, almost all the existing packet info files are still in the old format. There is one issue. If you use the new format, your packets will not be compatible with Mathematica 12.0 and earlier. You, only only 12.1 is the first version of Mathematica that uh, can handle packets in the new format. So that's something to keep in mind. You will have to use the old style format if you need to be compatible with older versions. 
All right, so now the extension section. So the extension section is where you declare the types of resources that your packet provides, right? The, the, the ways it extends the system. And there's, we've already seen, these are, very, these are the currently supported extension types. So we've already seen the kernel type, which is where you put your .m files. There's a front end extension where that's where you, you declare that you have things like pallet style sheets, front end resources. A documentation extension is where you is where you declare that you provide documentation notebooks that will integrate in the documentation system. There's something called a path extension, which lets you say that you can, you know, path-based lookups can find uh, files within your packlet as relative paths based on the packlet name. I'll show an example of that. It's very simple in a minute. You can also have a library link extension. This is where you say that you have libraries of, you know, Wolfram libraries. If you have a library link extension, you don't need to deal with dollar library path, right? The whole point of the packet manager is that it weaves packlets into the system in such a way that all the normal ways in which packets, you know, which things are expected to be found will work. So if you have a library link extension, you never have to worry about setting dollar library path to point to your libraries. There's a JLink extension where you put Java classes. And, and that, again, you don't have to call add to class path, JLink's add to class path function. If you use a, a JLink extension, Packet Manager automatically makes, takes care of making sure that your Java classes and Java files will be found by JLink. There's this uh, visual bug here in the front. And I, I could make this go away if I resize the window, but it's full screen, so whatever. There, there's an asset extension, which is uh, you know arbitrary files that can be looked up by a defined tag. And then there's this custom extension, which is any new extension you want to create. So for example, to implement a plugin type system, I could say, I could say, I could, I could look for all packlets that declare a, a certain filter or something, right? And if, if I wanted to implement a plugin system for filters, I, I can tell packet authors, just put a filter extension in your packlet and then my framework will be able to find your filter, right? You can, you know, you can put any extension type, you can make up your own in packlets. Right? Packet Manager won't know anything about them automatically, but you can use them in your own coding. All right. So just quickly here, here here's a more complex example packlet that has a different type of number of extensions, right? So we've seen the kernel extension, uh, there's a documentation extension, a front end extension, a path extension, and this assets extension. Um, you know, as most of these extensions are trivial, you just say documentation. Now, you can put more properties into this documentation extension, but you rarely have to because you typically you put your files in the expected place in the expected layout. So if I wanted to have, so the default root for a documentation extension is a documentation directory. And then the default layout within that is the standard layout for documentation files. If I wanted to put my documentation in a directory called something other than documentation, I could just say root arrow, you know, whatever. And then the packet manager would know to look there. But since everyone is generally gonna be putting their files in the standard locations, you generally don't even have to say anything. Same thing for a front end extension, right? There's a standard expected layout for front end resources. And if you use that, then you don't have to say anything more in your extension. So anyway, this is this packet that provides various resources. And I actually have this packlet here on my machine. This is the file layout of this packlet. There's the packet info file at top level, curl directory. Here's the front end directory with the standard uh substructure with my super palette in there and the documentation directory with a single guide page and then i have this access directory that has just sort of arbitrary files that i can look up by name all right so that's what the directory looks like now this directory is essentially exactly the the layout i might other than you know this assets thing it is essentially the layout that i would have had for uh for a, a standard application it's not like I had to build something very special to make a packet out of it. I kind of have a pretty standard layout and I throw in a packet info file and the packet manager can deal with it. So I saw someone raise their hand. Um, I don't know, Bob is trying, Bob is monitoring. Bob, if you want me to, to stop and uh, we, can, we can do that or we can just keep moving.
I've been looking at the pathable chat. I didn't see the hands. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. Anyway, I'm going to. So anyway, so I have this exact layout on my disk right now. And so let's 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 play with it. Uh, I've opened up these sections. I'm giving away my talk. Okay. All right. So. So I'm going to sort of essentially go through the workflow that I might, if I was going to give this packet to someone else, there's an easier workflow for local development, but I'm going to call the function create packet archive, which is the thing that zips up a directory that contains a packet into a dot packet file. A packet is not a dot packet file. A packet is a collection of things with a packet info file alongside them, but the dot packet file is a convenient way to distribute packets so that they can be installed or put on servers and things. So I've called create packet archive to create this dot packet file. And then I can say packet install of that packet file. And it's now installed on my system. And, and <laughs> you'll notice that the uh, style sheet for this presentation notebook is, has a little issue with these packet object blobs that get gigantic. So anyway, it, I get a packet object expression. So, but the point is that this packet has woven itself now into the system in all the ways that it's declared. I can just say needs on the package name that the packet declared, right? And then I can call functions within the packet. The path extension allows me to say, allows me to, in, 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 in well, from functions that expect paths, I can create a path, a relative path that just starts with the packet name. So it's, it's, it's as if this example packet directory was on the kernel style path, right? And so I can just do path lookups within my packet. This is, this, this is the uh, asset lookup of an asset within a packet. That, that, that packet declared that it had an asset called sun, right? So I, I, this packet object expression is the thing that sort of, it's like the constructor for a, installed packlet object expression. This creates the packet object expression from the installed packlet, simple thing. And then it just uses this property accessor syntax. I want the asset location named sun. And that gives me a path to that. So the asset is quite handy because it allows me to define essentially a symbolic name, sun for some arbitrary file within the packlet. And I'd never have to know in my program, I never have to deal with the actual path to that file. I just call it sun. If I change, if I want to change the location of that file within my packlet, I just change the packlet info file. I'd never have to change any code that uses the resource. And you know, there, fine, I can use it and it works. And then of course, there's also documentation. I said I had documentation. So this is a documentation link. You can ignore that silly uh, toy guide page I created, but it, it opens in the Wolfram Documentation Center just like any other documentation would. Um, so the docs from that packet are integrated into the system as well. And there's one other thing I, I said I had a palette well, there's super palette, right? That was the palette that thing declared. That thing has now appeared in the front end menu as well. So that packlet by virtue of being installed and declaring all the extensions, it just is automatically woven into the system. All right. All right, so now I'm gonna step away a little bit from pure packlet stuff to talk about something that's a new feature in Mathematica 13 that's quite important to the packlet story. So let's talk about solving the shadowing problem. Now we've all seen the shadowing warning message you get when you load two different packages that each define a symbol with the same name, right? When I, when I say needs of some package and it defines a symbol foo, and then I'd say needs of some other package that also happens to define a symbol named foo, then I'll get that familiar shadowing warning in Mathematica that we've probably all seen. It's a problem because when I say foo in my session, which foo is it referring to, right? Because we are all used to using this sort of global soup of a namespace of symbols. Because when we call needs, when we load packages, Mathematica puts those packages context on dollar context path. 
and that makes all their symbols visible without any kind of decoration on their names. This generally isn't a big problem in the Wolfram world because mathematics is a very highly curated integrated whole. And people aren't using a lot of different packages written by a lot of different authors. It's generally loading stuff that is either part of the system or it was written by me or maybe some small number of people, people in my organization maybe, and I don't often see that type of name conflicts. But it's certainly expected to become a much bigger problem as the Packlet ecosystem grows, right? There's definitely going to be, when there are thousands of Packlets on the Packlet repository, people are using them and downloading, and there's definitely going to be cases where there are Packlets that are using the same names for some of their symbols. Now, the Packlet names themselves are guaranteed to be unique by our system of requiring publisher ID names in Packlet names and their contexts are guaranteed to be unique, but the symbol names themselves are not, and they're going to be conflicts. So how do we solve this problem? Well, one big part of that is this new feature called context aliasing. You can specify short context as placeholders for long ones. So let's say I have a function that I define with this long context name, right? I can define a context alias. I just make an assignment to this uh, dollar context alias. I say CC backtick is an alias for this longer context. And then of course, I just type CC square five and I can call that function. It, it's as if the CC backtick gets simply replaced by context one, context two. All right, so you say, great. What is that? How does that really help us? Well, the real issue is that there is a new syntax for needs, which uses this arrow. Needs, developer, arrow, dev. What that does, well, it behaves like needs always has. It loads the context, but two big differences. First, it establishes a context alias of dev to point to developer. And crucially, it does not put developer on dollar context path. So this is a way of loading a package with needs, but not dumping all the packets, all the packages symbols into the global namespace. I have to use, I, I can type develop backtick back to refer to these functions, but if I don't want to type that long context prefix, I can just type dev. So there's a function called packed array queue in the developer context. I can call that with this dev prefix, all right? So needs, the syntax for needs is the key to, we, we don't wanna load things all into the global namespace, but on the other hand, we don't wanna go running around typing really long context names every time we type a symbol. Well, this needs syntax allows us to define a very short context areas of our own choosing and, and avoid, it and still have to specify the, you know, a decorated name. I just, I get to do it in a very short way. So here's what it looks like for a packet from the packet repository. So here, getting a little ahead of things, uh, Bob will show this sort of stuff in a minute. <laughs> I love the blob here, it fills the entire screen. Um, so here I'm installing a packet. This is by, by as it's with its resource name, this is the resource name of this packet on the packet repository. It's called Wolfram Code Equivalence Utilities. All right, now packets are in the packet repository, they're typically gonna have long context names because they're gonna have a publisher ID component of the name, that's what this is. So the symbols in this packlet have the context both from back to code equivalence utilities back to. But now when I load this package, if I load it with this syntax, I can avoid dumping all of its symbols into the global namespace but I can still call its methods almost as if I didn't have to type a whole bunch of gibberish at the beginning. I just type CE back to, all right? And then notice that the context, you know, has not been added to dollar context path. All right, so this new syntax for needs should really be considered the best practice when loading code from external packages. It's kind of a cultural shift here. People are not used to typing backticks in their code, right? You generally just use short names for everything because they all get loaded into the same big C of names. But I think people should get used to not having package symbols dumped into the global namespace. 
use the context alias syntax, and then a very short little declaration at the start of function names. All right. And then one last feature is this new function called packwood symbol. Uh, I know Stephen talked about this. It's, it's, it lets you invoke functions from packets in a very convenient way. So this is kind of a long line here. The, the arguments are, you know, sort of long, but there's this packlet symbol. And I put the first argument of this is, this is a re the resource name of the packet on the packet repository. And this is the name of the function in the packet that I want to call. And I can just do this one line and this is the answer to this thing. Um, so that single packet symbol call lets me invoke a function from a packet in the packet repository without any preamble whatsoever. I didn't have to call packet install. I didn't have to call needs. So what packet symbol did was it found the name resource or packet and installed it in a special way, which we'll discuss in a minute. It loads the packlet's main context, but does not add it to dollar context path. And then finally, it evaluates to the name symbol. It just, it simply evaluates to the symbol. It saves you three steps, right? <laughs> calling packet install, calling needs with the context alias, say, and and uh, you know, and, and then of course, just using the symbol. It, but you can use this sort of packet symbol as a, a shorthand for that. An important thing, though, is the packet symbol installs the packet in, in such a way that it's made visible in the current session, but not it will not be visible in subsequent sessions. Not be visible by default is what I mean by that. So a packet does not need to be downloaded again. If you invoke packet symbol in a future session, packet will be loaded and used from its sort of hidden location immediately. So it, basically this function allows you to quickly assess whether a packet does what you want, right? Without making any persistent changes to your environment. It's like a try before you buy type of thing. I can just uh, do a quick packet symbol call a function. If I like what it does, then maybe I'll, Maybe I'll go and I'll just install, call packet install, install the packet in the normal way, and then it will just be available uh, in the normal way forever. But uh, packet symbol kind of conveniently encapsulates the steps you need to do to quickly, in some sort of sheltered way, evaluate code from within a packet and see whether you like it or not. All right, and, and finally, this is not just some resources on packet documentation. There is a guide page to the packet system for a while now in the system. It has reference pages for all the functions. Um, there's an in-depth tutorial that will be in 13. For now though, people who don't have 13 can uh, read a useful reference, a sort of shortened version of the idea at that URL. And then there's packet tools, an important collection, which is in the system now. Uh, there'll be more to talk about that later today. And then this documentation tools palette, which is what you use to author documentation. There's a talk about that tomorrow. I'll just leave these things in this talk notebook for future reference. Okay, um, that's my part of the talk. I, there may have been some questions I haven't really been following, but I'm going to turn it over to to Bob, and maybe we can get to some things at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, there have been lots of good questions already. I've been trying to keep up with some of them, but. I'll, I'll try to get well, that. We'll get to well, it, whatever we don't get to. I'm hoping we can have time for at the end. So yeah, so now that you're all experts on packlets um, and you know how to develop them and you know, in the last you know 45 seconds, you've probably made a few good ones. Uh, well, you need a way to distribute those packlets because really one of the great motivators of having packlets at all is as a way to distribute this content, right? If you were just using it yourself, uh, you, packlets would have a little bit of benefit, but if you're using it, but the real where they really shine is through distribution. So, and we've had a way to do that as a company with the packlet server for a long time, but there hasn't been a good way for uh, users to, to do it themselves for developers to distribute their packlets. So that's why we're creating a packlet repository. Um, so what is the packlet repository? It's part of the resource system. So hopefully you've had a chance to 
interact with the resource system over the last few years using either the function repository, the data repository, or the neural net repository. Um, if not, this is our framework for distributing content that's not in the build. Um, there are other ones too, like the packet server and example data and stuff like that. But, um, but this is more and more becoming our go-to system for distributing content. Um, it may for end users, it makes the goal is to make it very easy to find and use packlets um, in the repository. And for developers, the goal is to make it as straightforward as possible to create and publish packlets. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the packlet repository. So, oh shoot, it's opening on the wrong screen. Let me try that again. There we go. All right, um, so these are the seven packlets that we have in the packlet repository at the moment. Um, if we pick one of these, this is one I made to bring in baseball statistics from a website. Um, and you can see it has a title and a description and it has this image that kind of is like a, a you know, flashy marketing style image. I mean, this one's not very beautiful, but uh, you know, it's, it's the idea of something, something to catch the eye on a website. Um, it has a guide page here. It can have like a bulleted list of details and tables. And then it goes into examples that anybody can just click here, puts it on the clipboard. You can paste it in a notebook and run it anywhere. So the idea is that it tells you everything about the packlet kind of on one page and you see what it does and you can just get going and use it right away. Also, every symbol uh, that's documented in the packlet and guide pages are available with their own documentation page that should work just like um, standard Wolfram language documentation. These hashes, there's data sets, there's, there they come. There's this issue where they load pretty slowly uh, that we are working on. Um, so you can see the documentation of packlets here should be, should provide everything that normal Wolfram language system documentation has. Um, so if from the end user's point of view, how do you find packlets that you might want to work with? Well, typically by searching, um, you can search on the web where we just were, or you can search in the language. Uh, I don't have dynamics, huh? There we go. All right. Um, right, so you, so you can use research search and it'll go out and find, find packlets. Uh, you can, and you know, so now packlets that come from the Wolfram Packlet Repository are also resource objects. You can work with them using Packlet object like uh, you would any Packlet from anywhere, or you can work with them using a resource object um, like you would a resource function or a data resource or a neural net resource. Um, and so that's useful. You can explore the metadata this way. You can get links back to the website. Uh, you can bring in secondary material like an example notebook. This is going to take a second because it tries to open full screen, which is a little annoying. It's going to happen. There it is. Um, so you, you, you know, you can grab in this, this sort of supplementary material um, and you could run this stuff right away. Um, let's get back to my slides. All right. So, so, you know, you can operate with this sort of uh, inspect things using the resource object. Um, so if you're familiar with the function repository, I would just want to sort of break this down because there's been a bit of confusion about why do we need a packlet repository when there's a function repository and vice versa. And Todd kind of mentioned this one, like if, you have, if your content fits into one of the other repositories, you probably want to use that uh, because it's more tailored to your content from both a developer point of view and from the end user point of view. Um, so, but comparing purely to function, right? The function repository takes a single function that works independently. It takes inputs and gives outputs and it kind of stands alone and it works that way. Uh, whereas the packlet repository is what Todd was just talking about. It's this large collection of interdependent things, whether they're symbols or style sheets or palettes or whatnot, right? So it's a much more complex thing. Uh, the, and then another, very important distinction between these two repositories is that the function repository, it, every submission is reviewed, uh, edited, um, sent back for revisions, 
uh, by a team of uh, reviewers here at Wolfram. So we control that content uh, moderately tightly, right? We wanna make sure that the names are consistent, that things will work together well, that uh, you know, you're not, that the output of a thing is, is computable if it should be computable and not some sort of weird typeset expression. You know, we kind of make sure things fit standards. Packlet repository is none of that, right? Instead of taking somewhere between days and weeks to get your, your content published, it takes just a few minutes. You push the button and a few minutes later, your packlet is published. Um, no reviewers. So in order to allow that, we had to implement this third bullet point where everything is living in a publisher ID based namespace. Um, so before in the function repository, you have something like resource function. Here, I'll just type it out. Resource function of bird say, right? Um, and and there's it's not like Rick colon bird say. We, you don't need that. Everything's in this global namespace that's controlled by the review team. For the packlet repository, you're going to have something with a publisher ID namespace where it's, uh, you know, something like it would be Rick colon space bird conversations. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, this is you have this namespace here. So that means you basically control that namespace. No one else can publish content there. So no, so there's no conflicts or ambiguity when when using the name. Um, another uh, important distinction for people who are used to function repository is that for the, in the function repository, when you get a definition notebook, it contains everything about the function. The, the definition is there, the documentation is there, the examples there, the metadata is there. It's all in there. If you have the notebook, you can recreate the resource function on demand. That's not true for a packlet, right? The packlet is in a direct, it lives in a directory on disk or in GitHub or something. Um, and the definition notebook just points at that. And it contains, it contains metadata, it, uh, it, it contains examples. Um, and, it, and, it, and it, you know, is connected to that directory so that all of the tools of the definition notebook can, uh, can access that directory and inspect it as needed. But having the notebook doesn't mean you have the packlet, right? So that, that can be a, a tricky point. All right, um, so for developers, so now we're kind of moving into the developer phase of things. Um, restrictions and conventions. Like I just mentioned, uh, we have this publisher ID based namespace. So the name of the actual packlet object is gonna start with your publisher ID and then this double underscore is the is separator we decided on. It's a little weird, but it works. Um, and you don't usually end up spending too much time looking at packlet names. Um, and then all your code lives in a context based on your publisher ID too. Um, so that, that's like a, a restriction that we put on. Um, and if you don't do that, we will either block your packlet from being published or take it down as needed. Uh, uh, by convention, although not enforced, it's nice to put your code in publisher ID packlet base name, then the name of the symbol or function, right? So Bob, baseball reference data, player statistics, um, right? Um, also, we want another restriction is we don't want things that quietly modify system settings. So when somebody loads your packlet, it shouldn't change the working directory behind the scenes, right? That's, that's bad. If, all, if you have multiple packlets and they all did that, it would be, it would be a hellish uh, environment. So, uh, you know, you can certainly have a function that works just like set directory in your packlet that's transparent and does these things, but you shouldn't quietly be doing that sort of thing. Uh, symbols should be documented with examples. Um, and we have great new documentation tools that are accessible for the first time in version 13. Uh, and hopefully I'll have time to demonstrate a little bit of that. And you must create a packlet resource definition notebook. And that's gonna be what the uh, most of my talk should be focusing on. Um, aside from these few bullets, we also have uh, this web page that you'll have access to if you're in the beta program. Um, I'll mention the beta program at the very end of the talk too. Um, that light that lays out more conventions and guidelines and workflows. 
Um, this is going to be expanded greatly as the packet repository moves through beta and out of beta. There's not going to be all one long guidelines document. We're going to we're going to build that out. But for now, that's that's the best reference for for how to how to get started as a developer. All right. Um, so um, the packet resource definition notebook. This is like the function resource definition notebook if you've ever created a resource function, but uh, different in important ways. Um, so it's linked to a packlet directory, like I've mentioned. Um, it has an auto conversion tool uh, for existing packlets that you might have developed that don't have the publisher ID prefix. So if you have something you've made and you wanna put in the packlet repository and you think, oh gosh, I have to go in and add publisher IDs everywhere. We're trying to make that as, you, yes, you do, but we're trying to automate that so that it all just happens magically for you. Um, and then like the other definition notebooks, it has a, you know, a suite of validation and auto fix tools that are built into the notebook. So we try to detect common issues with packlets and, and packlet resource objects and help you address those. All right, so now I'm going to dive in and try to live demo this whole process. Um, and hopefully I won't run out of time and we can do something neat. All right, so when I, yeah, so this code will work right now um, for anyone using 13, but you know, there's not really a beta 13 yet, but when it does, go ahead and try this out. Um, and this is gonna say, where is your packlet? If you don't have a packlet already, you can just choose a new directory. Steven showed that in his keynote, um, but I'm gonna demonstrate um, the case where you already have a packlet. So I have this one called STL redistrict that I made kind of like anybody would make a packlet, not even thinking about the packlet repository. I'm going to choose that and it's going to ask me over here. Uh, it says, this is probably really small text coming over Zoom for you guys, but it says packlet is missing publisher ID. And then it explains that if I want to submit it to the Packlet repository, I need a publisher ID and ask me what I want to do. So I can proceed as is. So that means I'm not going to submit this to the Packlet repository. I just want to use your tools to help me make my Packlet the way I want to use and distribute my own way. Um, convert Packlet, which will modify my current files on disk. Um, so it might, if I don't have like a Git history or something, that might be a little bit risky because you going backwards would be difficult. Um, or convert a copy of a packlet. That's what I think most people should do. Um, so this explains what's, what it's gonna do, but I'm gonna explain that with my mouth noises so we don't need to read that. Um, so now it's going and converting that packlet. And there we go, I have a definition notebook. And I just wanna confirm these things. Okay, that's the right packlet name, the right context name. Okay, got a little front end beach balling here. Let's see, there we go. All right, um, let me just make sure that I'm, okay. Um, all right, so here's the packlet resource definition notebook. I'm gonna move out of full screen because I don't want to work in full screen. <laughs> That's a good reason, right? All right, so, um, and before we dive into this, actually, let's look at what the auto conversion tools did for us. So here I have uh, Visual Studio Code. It's the IDE that I use mostly. And I have, I have uh, it open to the directory that had my packlet in it. So this STL redistrict is the original packlet directory that I had made um, before I did conversion. And here's the packlet info file. And you can see the only place that says Bob is in this creator field, right? That's my name. It's not really computable data. It's just the label that says who made it. It doesn't say Bob anywhere else, right? This is all it says is STL redistrict and stuff like that, right? If I look in a code file like this utilities, again, it doesn't say Bob anywhere. Um, it just it just is a normal normal uh, packlet like one would have developed at any point. But then I go up here to this copy of the directory. You see Bob double underscore STL redistrict. If I open that up, I'm gonna look in packlet info and now there's Bob all over the place. Got Bob double underscore in the packlet name. My context has Bob, my symbols have Bob in them. Um, so, so, and, and it's added this uh, additional property 
to the Packlet metadata, publisher ID goes to Bob. And that's because if I do a dollar publisher ID, let's see if it'll let me. Ah, dollar publisher ID. Bob is my publisher ID, right? It, it doesn't need to be your name, it could be anything. All right, and then if I look in the code files, you'll see where a big in package has Bob in it. These, these symbol names have Bob in their context. This uh, packlet resource, which I guess is a little bit outdated now that we have the assets thing. This is kind of the old solution to that asset location thing Todd was showing, but it's inserted Bob in there too. So there's all sorts of places where this auto conversion has inserted my publisher ID. Um, and you know, it's not a hundred percent, you know, you could have in your code, this little snippet here might've been like hidden in a byte array or something. And the auto conversion inspector is not gonna like dig into that, find everything, convert it and recreate a byte array, right? Um, it, 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 we're trying to add as many conveniences as possible, but there are still cases where you're gonna do the auto conversion and it might break your packlet and you're gonna need to go in and find out um, how to fix it. Um, and we'll try to help as much as we can with documentation, guidelines, more auto conversion things, more tools to help with that process. Um, all right, sorry, I, I wanted to get back to my new definition notebook. Um, all right, so let's see, time is getting tight. We'll see what I can get through here. Let's just look at what this is. So this is the, the name, the resource name, the description. Here's where the packlet is. So this is a very important thing because this is sort of a, a live link between this definition notebook and the actual packlet. We have this, what we call a manifest, which is essentially a, like a file browser here where you can click on any of these and you can go in and modify them. Um, this is created automatically. You know, you don't have to make this. This just is created for you. Um, and then we have this web content area where basically you can put the content that uh, you want to appear on the website, on the main landing page of the website. Um, and main guide page, this is where you can select one of your guide pages and, and have it embedded on that landing page. Um, all right, and then we have this example section. So th these pink cells, they say, if you, I don't know if you can read this over Zoom, it says excluded. So these are cells that kind of exist for the developer to use to load their context uh, for in, while they're creating examples that won't actually show up in the packlet. Um, all right, so now if I say Bob STL redistrict, I could use context aliasing here, um, but uh, I don't think we wanna encourage people to use that in this case. So here, uh, this is, this kind of puts out a large result. This is, I'm not gonna really talk about what this packlet does. It's not that, uh, you know, revolutionary. It's, it's trying to create new ward boundaries in the city of St. Louis. Um, we have, we're reducing the number of wards and we have new census data. So it's an opportunity to do something great. Um, let's see, this is taking longer than I thought it would. Let's see, I'll just type out the next thing. All right. I have a thing that makes a nice visualization, which is where I was going with this. All right, so here we have this guy and I wanna use this for my uh, web page content thing. I'm gonna convert it to a bitmap, uh, make it a little bit smaller, grab it. I'm gonna put it here. All right, now I got a, a headline image. I'm gonna say um, code to stop my legislators from drawing their own districts. Um, I can give like a bulleted list here and then uh, a main guide page. So that's, that'll be the next step. So if I go up here and look at my documentation, I don't have any guide pages yet. So let's see if we have time to try to make one. Um, so we have documentation tools. I'm gonna say new guide page and that's gonna launch this guy. Oh, it's gonna ask me what the name is. I'm gonna call it redistrict. Uh, and this guy, you can see I have a little, there's a little bug about dynamic content. Anyway, so this is a guide, this is the new documentation tools palette. And there's an entire talk about this tomorrow, I think at one o'clock from Brian Van Vertloo. Um, so if you're interested in that, 
and writing your own documentations. This is the new exciting exposure of our documentation system in version 13. Um, so right now I'm on the function page tab. I'm gonna switch to guide page tab and I'm gonna write a quick guide page. So this will be like the name of a function like auto district that you saw me run. This can be more symbols but, or I think I also used a uh, block plane map. Uh, not a great name. These aren't great names now that I think about it. Um, create, you want to give a little tagline, create uh, district boundaries automatically. Um, display a map of districts. And then here is like, I have something called block graph. I have something called dollar block data set. Um, and then I can go in here and there's the, this links section that can open up if the front end wants to show, I can say link to function. I'm not sure if I actually need to do this here or if the build, the documentation build does it automatically, but I just want to show kind of using these buttons in this documentation tools palette. Um, so this is to create a guide page. You can also create function pages um, and tech notes, um, which are kind of uh, longer uh, explanations of, of your packlet and what it's for and how it fits into the world. I should add something here like um, tools for redistricting. All right, so now I have, I've made a guide page. Um, and I can save it, I can close this, I can close this, and all right, so let's see. I'm, oh, and then I want to select that guide page in this web content as my main guide page. File, File. Browse. see this should probably directly go to this directory, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, so now that, that's my main guide page. So that's saying that it'll show up when I publish this thing. All right, let's see. And then let's see, I'm gonna delete this content for now. And then I have this metadata section. So here I have GitHub thing. This thing is actually in GitHub. Let's, so let's find the right link, GitHub. Here we go, select this. Um, and this will show up on the website as well. All right, so, and then I wanna put in search terms like politics, um, census data. Uh, I wanna choose categories, like this is definitely geographic data and computation, uh, it's social, cultural, linguistic data. It's probably visualization graphics. I wanna put related resource objects. Uh, I'm running out of time though, but if I was gonna do this all the way out, I would go search the other repositories. I know the data repository has census tracks in it. I would, put, I would find the name of that resource. I'd put it in here. If there are compatibility issues like this requires a certain version or certain operating system, we have tools for that. And then you would come up here and you would start using the check button. Um, and that's really what I wanna highlight. This is where the power of these definition notebooks really comes in. What this does is it goes through both the notebook and the packlet and it finds things where it thinks you might have issues. Um, and it and some of them, uh, right, so this says it's not uh, listed here. So, so and then the, over on, if you go over on the right, oftentimes the issues will have these auto fix functions. So here's this one, the cell contains very large graph images instead of reducing resolution. So here's an auto fix, reduce resolution of large images in this cell. Right, so that's great. Um, and then basically the workflows keep running check until it says no issues were found. Or sometimes you, it might say that the issue is that I don't have a build. Um, but once, oh, this is, this one can be ignored. That's an issue that we've, uh, okay. This is not in the packlet info. So this is a cool one, add missing simple to packlet info. So this is gonna open up packlet info file and say, it's gonna add it here in my symbols list and say, do you wanna save the changes? So I look at it, I say, yeah, yeah, that should be 
one of the declared symbols in the packlet info file. Um, so I do that. And then the process would be keep running check, keep running check until there aren't any issues. Then I'm going to, then I would run build. And the build operation, depending on the size of your packlet, can take a few minutes. The main uh, time is spent on the documentation, taking sort of that author mode of the documentation where things look a little bit ugly, but they're in a state for writing and building it into the nice, pretty documentation that users of your packlet are gonna see. Uh, but you see, you get a nice little progress bar that tells you, um, that keeps you informed on how many, when it's doing that documentation build, how many files it's done, how many it has to do. Um, and then once the build is done and you get a successful build and the check has been done and it isn't flagging any issues, then there's kind of two avenues to go. You can either go the deploy avenue or the submit avenue. So the deploy is basically, if you don't want it in the public repository, you just want it for yourself or your colleagues. You can deploy it to your computer for yourself or you can deploy it to your cloud account. And that's often as good as publishing in the repository because it works just the same. The only difference is the whole world won't stumble upon it. The only people who will find it are people that you send the URL to, right? Um, it's your cloud object, it's your cloud account. Uh, you control it more closely. Uh, we won't take it down because it's, you know, breaking some of our conventions with packlet, I, with context space or uh, modifying system symbols, right? You don't have to worry about those conventions then. Um, all right, so you have it built. And then the other step is submit to repository. We're gonna change this name to publish uh, in repository. And that will put it in the public from packlet repository. I'm not gonna do that right now because I don't really think this one's quite ready. But if I did that, it would spin for a minute, it would give me a result. And then about five to 10 minutes later, I would get an email saying your, your packlet is published, right? So that 10 minutes is you know, generating web pages, putting them in the right place. Um, you know, sort of an asynchronous process that happens behind the scenes. And once you get that email, you're good. You're a published developer in the Wolfram language. All right, so let's, um, that was the main thing I wanted to show and talk about today, but uh, the beta program, right? I promised I'd mention this. So if you're interested in being a beta developer for the Packlet repository, all three of these things point to the same web form. So, you know, zorp it into your browser, however you want. Maybe somebody can put this in the pathable chat for me. Um, but fill out that web form, just gonna be your email address or your cloud user ID, which is an email address. Um, and we will get you added to the, the beta program. If you're, if you're a Wolfram employee, you don't even need to do it. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then I also wanna here, give you three more seconds to take a screenshot, or copy, uh, yeah, transcribe it or whatever. All right, and then the last thing is Packlet Talks, other Packlet Talks throughout this conference. Um, our colleague Connor is giving a talk this afternoon about how to actually make a good Packlet, right? I didn't, neither of us really talked about how to make a good Packlet, just how to make a Packlet and how to make it for the Packlet repository. If you wanna know how to make it good, go to Connor's talk. And then tomorrow, as I mentioned, Brian is giving a talk about documentation tools, um, which is, you know, we saw that little palette with the blue and the orange tabs. Uh, he's really gonna be diving into that and what it can do and how to use it. Um, so I highly recommend those two talks. And now I will uh, stop and Todd will rejoin me and we will answer questions. Um, let me... Let's see, I think I have. I've been trying to plow through chat questions. Okay, anything myself. Anything that's more more Bob? Yeah, there, there have been a few, um, a number that I've sort of glossed over that I think you'd be better to oh, more about the, the specifics of um, okay. requirements and things. Okay, well, do you want me, do you want to rephrase them to me or do you want me to, um, well, I'm, I'm actually Search in the middle this. of typing out a reply to okay. one question. And I, okay, I well, I'll just go to the it. top then and work my way down. We have zero you minutes could, left. How long yeah, could that take? Yeah, you could probably start in the middle because the top ones, I think, have mostly yeah. been already. All right. I, so I, so I, there's one at the beginning about security. Um, I don't know if we got a good answer to that. Dave, Dave asked early on 
during your talk. Yeah, but, uh, I, I, I put an answer in there. I don't know if you, oh, you did. It's not showing up for me. Maybe I need to refresh or something. Well, you, if you if you click on the thread, show thread. Yeah, it's right. just my just my thing saying I'll talk about this later. All right. Hopefully you've addressed that. You know, th there was maybe there was a second thread. I think it was. My OK, uh, OK, well, well, let's just say something out loud. So we don't have any technical way to constrain code from a packlet when it's running in a Wolfram session. If the packlet is loaded, the code that's running from that packlet runs like any other code. We can't uh, sandbox that code and have it operate differently than code outside of the packlet. So we don't have a way to do that, um, which is what it seems like he's asking for. Uh, we do plan on having like a place where for non-malicious users that might just have code that doesn't do things you want, where you can declare this uses the internet, this uses the file system, this uses that. And if it turns out that somebody doesn't have the right declarations, declarations is the wrong word because that means something else for code, uh, where somebody says my packet doesn't use the file system and then it does, then we can take that packet down sort of thing. Um, but we don't have like a, a sandbox environment where packlets run independently from other code. That is not something we are providing. Um, so definitely reputation is important. Um, yeah. All right, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I, you must have, I'm gonna try refreshing this page because I think you must have responded to some of these and I'm not, see, not seeing it. Um, Todd and I will also be around all conference. So you can message us on the conference rocket chat or anywhere else. Okay, you responded to Jesse's question about path, um, looks like. Let me just jump in for a second because I did manage to get, a, I got a meetup scheduled on Friday oh, at 2 p.m. That's right after the talk on Packlet uh, documentation authoring. Um, there is a meetup that'll show up on the schedule at uh, 2 p.m. on Friday about packet development. Uh, and so people have questions about setting up packets for their own stuff or any other types of questions about the packet system, please come to that. I mean, you can sit, I can actually help people. If you have some actual thing that you want to turn into a packet, you can probably work on that right then and there. Okay, anyway. uh, Guido is asking about Workbench. Um, so Workbench for a long time has had some of these same tools for developing packets and writing documentation. I think that's all going to be considered obsolete at this point. Is that right, Todd? Well, really what would be really nice because I use the Workbench constantly. I, I'm a big fan of it, but the packet related tools in it are wildly out of date. I never really use them they don't really function. Um, I would love to see an update to Workbench to bring it up to speed. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure, you know, if or when that's going to happen. I, I won't be doing it myself, so it's hard to speak about that. I would love to see it happen because I, I think it's a great tool. Uh, right now, they really don't function, and uh, I recommend people do Packlet development uh, using Packlet tools, using the Packlet repository uh, submission process, or by hand. All right, Jesse is asking about auto updating. I think we are going to disable auto updating yeah. for packlets in the packlet repository as a policy. Um, so you'll need, we might allow a thing where you can get uh, a prompt where it, uh, if you use a packlet at some point, it can prompt you to update, but uh, it's not going to, we're not going to allow things to silently update whenever there's a new version. Um, it's going to need to be something that you actively do. Um, oh, Michael's asking about GitHub uh, webhook. Yes, like GitHub Actions or continuous integration or continuous deployment. Yes, th those, those are definitely things we plan to support and have, but not early in the beta program. Um, but yes, that is, we are going to do that. We're going to have GitHub Actions so that when you merge or branch or release branch or something, it can automatically publish an update. Um, There's actually several, quite a few questions about GitHub and that kind of flow. It's, it's clear that people are quite interested in that. And 
like Bob mm-hmm. said, we are definitely look, working on that, looking at that right now and trying mm-hmm. to come up with the- At some point, the you at some point you will need to make a packet resource definition notebook and put it in your GitHub repository. And then, and then the GitHub actions can work for all future updates, right? But at some point you need to make that definition notebook. And then you'd only need to use it again if you want to make changes to the landing page image or the, the you know, the examples that show on the landing page sort of thing. Um, all right. Uh, is there a standard, typical, or implied license for packet code? Uh, we're actually very soon we'll have a drop down in the definition notebook where you select a license um, from, from a small list of commonly used licenses, you know, the, the Creative Commons and MIT and those sort of things. Um, so so that, that will be part of it. It's, that, that, that is coming within a week, probably. Um, that's, that's on the very soon short list. Um, can you deploy to any of the Wolfram server deployment options? So I'm guessing that's thinking about like application server um, and um, the other one whose name escapes me. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can use packlets in those. You, you know, any Wolfram engine can, can access packlets, right? So you can have a packlet installed in that system. Um, I'd right, if, that, if that's what the question is about. If that's what the question is about. Are they talking about like obtaining packlets from those right. deployment options? Or are they talking about installing packlets into kernels running in those options? You could certainly uh, use packlets. Right. If you want to make an wolf for, like an application server that is a packlet repository, it's going to be a, some work. It's not impossible, but that that's not like what we're trying to do here. Um, Let's see. Well, we are definitely well over time. So please uh, keep your questions for that chat that Todd mentioned tomorrow at two o'clock. Right. Central. I, I don't think it's officially showed up on the schedule yet, but. Okay. Uh, look, well, it's going to happen. That. Mark it, mark it on your own calendar, uh, two o'clock tomorrow, bring your questions. Hopefully we can get like a dump of this chat and we can have a place to start uh, tomorrow as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thanks, everyone.